Hi everyone, uh, my name is Robin and I lecture on the foundation year. Um, so what I'm going to do today is try and give you a very brief overview of what the foundation year is and then introduce you to one of the modules which is called cultural fluency. And then in the last 10 minutes, hopefully we'll have time to answer any questions you have about the foundation year. Uh, you've probably chosen to attend today's uh, mini lecture because you already have an interest in the foundation year or some knowledge of what it is. But just to summarize, the foundation year is like the year zero of a degree. So on the foundation year, we try to introduce you to the range of subjects that we teach in SOAS and to give you some kind of background in terms of knowledge to those subjects but also really help you to build the academic skills and the confidence you need to be a great student. Um, you don't have to choose the actual pathway in terms of the degree you want to study until the end of the foundation year. So if you're someone who knows that you really want to take a degree, but you're not quite sure yet in what direction you want to head, that could be useful for you to know. Okay, so let me just introduce you to some of the key modules we have on the foundation year. The core module is called academic practice. And academic practice really is focused on helping you to develop the academic skills you'll need to be a really successful student. And although we're focusing quite a lot on writing great academic essays or giving great academic presentations, we're also focusing a lot on reading and research and the type of critical thinking skills and creative thinking skills you need to be a brilliant student. Then, as you've probably seen, if you've checked out the website or any literature on the foundation year, there's two streams on the foundation year. There's business management, economics and law and social sciences, arts and humanities. And depending on which stream you're on, you'll have lectures and seminars orientated around business management, economics and law, or social sciences, arts and humanities. And hopefully these lectures and seminars will give you a really strong foundation in terms of knowledge of what you'll need to know, or some kind of basis to give you a head start for studying business management, economics and law, or any social sciences, arts and humanities subject and so on. The most popular module is one called the world from SOAS, which is quite difficult to explain without um, going into the module in great depth, because it really tries to introduce how in SOAS we perceive the world and the kind of unique values we have in terms of how we approach different topics. And um, so, in brief, it's an introduction to the economic, political and social history of the world, but from a SOAS perspective. I think the most common feedback we get from students on that module is that it's everything we wanted to learn in school, but never got the opportunity. And then I'll just move on then to the module I'm going to talk about today, which is cultural fluency. And on cultural fluency, there are no lectures. Everything is seminar based. Or in other words, although we provide some materials in terms of articles, films, documentaries, blogs, social media resources, the emphasis is on the students to apply the kinds of academic theories and concepts that they will need for their applying to their academic interests but also hopefully to their own personal interests. And so we'll be developing critical thinking skills, creative thinking skills, and hopefully your sense of confidence in yourself as a student and your ability to study independently and to drive your own learning. Um, so in order to explain cultural fluency, we probably need to start by just agreeing on what we mean by culture. A dictionary definition of culture, and this is just what I took from the Cambridge Dictionary, was a way of life, especially the general customs and beliefs 
of a particular group of people at a particular time. And while I think we often associate culture with nations in terms of English culture, Irish culture, Italian culture, we could be talking about any group. So we talk about pop culture or business culture, or even your school or college probably has its own culture in terms of the way people behave, the beliefs that people share, the way they dress, the jokes they tell, the music they listen to. Um, and there's a very good chance that any culture changes over time and changes over space. So you've probably noticed that the school you went to feels very different to a school three miles away and that you can identify students from different schools, not only by how they dress or their school uniform, but because they talk slightly differently and have different jokes and think different kinds of music um, is better than others. So we can describe cultures, but because cultures change over time and space, we can infer that different forces shape culture. And that's what we're gonna be looking at in the rest of today's short lecture is how power changes culture. So just as a very quick example of that, probably the majority of films you've watched in your life have been from America and from Hollywood. Um, and if, certainly if you go to the cinema uh, in Britain, the majority of films will come from the United States. But Nigeria make great films, Korea makes great films, Argentina makes great films. So why do we watch so many American films? And the answer is really simple there. That is just the economic and political power of the US gives them not only the financial clout to make very big budget films, but also to control distribution, to establish um, strong links with other elements of American culture, such as through TV, music, they're interlinked as a kind of cultural power. But even at a more local level, if you wanted to look at British business, for example, you'd be able to see that within corporate culture, power is active and power shapes the way that corporate culture operates. So if you just want to look at FTSE 100 companies, who has the power? Well, only 5% of CEOs in FTSE 100 companies are women. And even if there are increasing numbers of women on boards um, or on board of directors, what kind of values predominate in those boardrooms? Well, if those boardrooms are dominated by males, certain types of behaviors and certain kinds of values will most likely predominate, while others might not. Um, what do these men who dominate UK companies look like? Well, 69% of FTSE 250 companies do not have any BAME directors. So it's predominantly white male from similar socioeconomic backgrounds. Now, we might think that this doesn't matter very much, but these power relations are obviously going to shape people's opportunities in life and the way we feel we can behave in certain cultural situations. So if uh, FTSE 500 companies are dominated by white males, this means that certain groups of individuals are more likely to have access to power and others will find it more difficult to enter certain jobs or to gain equal rights or have access to promotions or certain entitlements. So power relations shape culture and these power relations influence our lives. And what we're going to do now is have a think about how power relations might influence education. And in fact, the first assignment on cultural fluency 
is to give a very short presentation, analyzing the power relations in any subject you've studied. So you could now get a gigantic head start on your first um, seminar, or sorry, on your first assignment for cultural fluency by just thinking of one subject you've studied. Maybe you're even doing A-levels at the moment. Maybe you've recently completed some form of education at some level. So would you mind just writing down a subject you have recently studied in the chat box, please? Any subject at all? Literature, history, economics, All the way through, I heard a brilliant presentation yesterday on geology, and economics, maths. Okay, and what we're going to try and do then over the next 15 minutes or so is identify or introduce a number of academic theories that we could apply to our own education and see what we've learned about power relations. Because maybe once we've identified the power relations within education, our own education, we'll be able to think about how we can change that education system, because obviously the education system really influences culture and our lives. Okay, so the first one is really obvious, which is patriarchy. Um, so patriarchy, is male power, as you already probably know. But when we're looking at it in cultural fluency, we'll probably try look more at the complexities of male power. Um, but for now, we'll keep it simple enough, except to say in the cultural fluency, we wouldn't only look at feminism, we'd also try and look at intersectional feminism and the way that feminism operates across cultures. And now, the first thing we could look at is just the curriculum for the subject that you have noted down here. And if you were to do a scan of the curriculum, for example, the key issues you cover or the key figures you should study in terms of the people you should study, um, the most prominent figures you've studied, you'll probably see immediately that they are mostly men. So if you're studying economics, who are the key thinkers? Or if you're studying sociology, who did the key theories come from? But you might also want to have a look at when women are represented, how they are represented. So it's true that we might see women represented in a history curriculum or, well, history is a good example, actually. So in history, we might cover or be introduced to the story of Florence Nightingale or Anne Frank, maybe. But what if all the women that feature in our education are represented as being carers or victims? And then when women are included, what are their backgrounds and who are they intended to represent? And who are they speaking for? So when we do have women theorists or we do see women represented. Are those women always from, from, from one background? And when they are represented, is it intended that they represent all women? Because the problem could be that we might, for example, have women represented, but it's always middle-class white women. And they're always speaking for, or often speaking for all women. Um, while other women with different backgrounds are never represented. And if male power dominates education systems, what ideas and values about the world are being reproduced? So if you think about your history textbook, if the history textbook was written from a point of view that challenged patriarchy, would there be such an emphasis on war? And would the language and narrative of the history textbook have such an emphasis on certain values that were considered heroic? For example, 
great leaders or war heroes, etc. So the other way to consider how our education might be shaped in relation to patriarchy has to do with just gender and what it means to be a man or woman. So from our education, what feedback do we get on who we should be aspiring to be in terms of how we um, perform as men or women? So what does it mean to be a normal man or a normal woman? Um, is there space to consider different experiences and different possibilities of what it might to be a human that doesn't satisfy traditional gender norms or gender roles? So what would society look like if we had an education system that wasn't accepting of patriarchy or reproduced male power again and again, but instead challenged traditional assumptions about gender and heteronormativity. Now, moving on to the theme that we would actually start the module with, which is nationalism. Um, and the first article we look at on cultural fluency is one by Benedict Anderson, who asks, how can we think of the world as being divided into nation states, rather than us all being united as human beings? But yet it now seems so natural when we turn on the TV and watch the Olympics or on Sunday morning, the baking program we watch is called the Great British Bake Off, that we are all divided into a world of nation states with separate and very distinguishable um, characteristics and cultures. So, just as an example of how strange Anderson thinks it is that we're divided into nation states. He asked, how come we feel that we share a great affinity with everybody within the borders of the territory we live in that we call a state when we've never met them? So how come somebody who might work in a car factory, maybe in a big city like Manchester, feels they share a deep connection with someone who might be a farmer in somewhere rural like Cornwall. Uh, how come the farmer from Cornwall probably feels a much stronger connection with the factory worker from Manchester than a farmer from Normandy or Kerry? Well, Anderson says that this affinity or connection we feel with other people inside our nation can't be natural. It needs to be something constructed or a feeling that we learn to have through living in society and being educated to feel that everyone within a nation state has some very strong bond. And it's, I think nationalism is so ingrained in who we are, we find it hard to imagine that once nation states as they are now never existed. So if you think of Italy and Italians, you probably imagine them to have a really deep um, historical connection. And that's why we get the feeling that Italian culture is so identifiable and distinct. But Italy was a collection of separate kingdoms until 1861. So if you want to look at a map of Italy from 200 years ago, it's not there. It's a collection of many smaller kingdoms that only became united 150 years ago. But sometimes when you make that argument, others argue that although states are something modern or something very recent, the cultural connection that underpins those states is something that has existed for a very long time. So if you take France as an example, you might say France is a modern state, but the culture of France existed before the state. But historians have shown that that's probably not true. So according to the historian Eric Hobsbawm, at the time of the French Revolution, 50% of the people in France did not speak any French at all. And only 12 or 13% of people spoke French. So how did France generate such a strong sense of everyone within its borders 
sharing the same culture and being unified in some way? Well, I would argue that a great part of that is through education. And if you want to have a look at your own education, you'll probably see that through much of or through many of the subjects you've studied, the idea that nation states is not na are natural is never questioned. But if you look at subjects like history or literature, you'll see a story of the nation being told that encourages you to believe in the inevitability of the nation and nation, and nation state. So if you just look at your history textbook, what wars are being celebrated and what figures are being considered great? Or when you look at a literature curriculum, where are all the authors from and what values are being promoted in the texts you read? So most of our education is not a story of all human beings or of all human history, literature, society and politics. It's the story of a nation. But because of its story, within that story, we'll probably find that certain groups of people are emphasized and play a predominant part in that story. But some groups might have their role minimized or not represented at all. So where is the experience, for example, in your British history A-level curriculum of those who suffered or were displaced or were enslaved or died as a consequence of British imperialism. Or in the tale of 20th century Britain, where are the black people? Where are South Asian people? Where are British Muslims? And what does this lack of representation of some groups tell us about who is valuable to the nation and who belongs? And how would this then influence society? And then the final part, um, or the final section we're going to look at today is colonial thought and the influence of colonialism on our education. So I just mentioned nationalism in the last section and how the facts of what happened during the area of British colonialism may sometimes be overlooked. But what I want to focus on now is not physical colonialism itself in the 18th, 19th and early 20th century, but the legacy of colonial thought. So in seminar two in cultural fluency, we'd have a look at a theorist called Edward Said, who shows how in the 18th and 19th century, Europeans were developing an idea of themselves as being modern, scientific, progressive and advanced. And then it served Europeans to think of non-Western cultures as being traditional, primitive, backward and timeless. So that non-Western cultures were like a mirror. So that just as when you're a, an insecure teenager in school, it makes you feel good to present someone else as being bad. It served Europeans to think of non-Western cultures as being inferior to them. So Western European cultures were rich, sophisticated, complex, and in contrast then, non-European cultures were um, simple, homogenous, and timeless. And that's why Europeans could talk about great expanses of territory as if they were all the same. Even the name of this university is the School of Oriental and African Studies as if the Orient was one unit that shared very similar or homogenous characteristics and then could be studied as such, as if they were all the same in terms of culture and also in terms of the people. So what we're talking about here is a hierarchical way of viewing the world with Europe or at least Western Europe being supreme and then other regions being viewed as not only inferior, but that Western Europe should be the model for those non-Western European cultures. So physical colonialism is over, but be interesting to look at your own studies and think, to think about 
what assumptions from colonial times remain. So when you study societies and sociology, what kind of societies are considered the norm? Are they always Western cultures? When non-Western cultures are presented, are they presented as being equal in terms of sophistication and complexity as Western cultures? Um, whose thought about societies is considered most important? Are there only Western sociologists on your sociology curriculum? Or when you study economic development and geography or in economics, who is considered developed and why? And who is third world or underdeveloped? And how are they presented in comparison to the West? And who are the forces who can drive or promote development? Can non-Western cultures drive their own development? Or do they need help and assistance from the West? And why would that be? Or when you study art, whose art is considered classical or surreal or abstract? And whose is considered to be perhaps not primitive, but of more historical or anthropological value? So even though colonialism is over, or not colonialism is over, but even though the physical colonialism of Western Europe may be over. It might be interesting to look at your own educational experience to think about whether the legacy of colonialism still exists. So when we're looking at education from a cultural studies point of view, analyzing the parallelations evident in our own educations, we could think about what knowledge was considered of value, but what knowledge was left out or was not included? What people or groups were considered to be of value and who was not included or represented? Whose ideals and values were being reproduced and whose were not being represented at all? Um, in your own educational experience, did you feel included or represented or did you feel in some way that your own experience was being overlooked and could there and i think this is the big one to consider after answering those questions could there have been alternative ways of teaching learning and assessing what you learned because maybe the outcome of analyzing parallelations could be that we make a meaningful change. Um, so the cultural fluency module hopes to embody some of the remit of the foundation year. Um, on this module, we are definitely introducing academic theory and trying to help you develop academic skills. But what we're going to do with that theory is um, encourage you to apply the concepts and arguments to your own life, your own experiences, and the areas of academic interest that you want to research in the future. Um, and we also want to give you as much autonomy as possible so that you can drive transformation in your own life. And um, in the final assessment for a cultural fluency, you develop a portfolio which applies the theories that have really interested you to whatever issues um, that matter to you the most. So the final assignment is just to take five theories from cultural fluency and apply them to five topics that really interest you. And then the seminars are designed to help you develop your own knowledge so that you can deepen your understanding of these issues, deepen your academic skills, but also develop a deeper sense of who you are and how your own education can benefit you. Okay, I, I can't believe I've actually finished slightly early. And um, so if you've any questions then, Aman can help to do the tech. <laughs> uh, but if you have any questions about the foundation year, please fire away or about what we've just talked about.
Okay, so we've got a few questions in the Q&A section. It's also worth mentioning to all the attendees that we have a, a student present from the foundation here, Nirina, who's in the chat. So if you have any questions about uh, wanting to be a, about what it's like to be a SOAS student on the foundation here, please feel free to ask questions uh, directed to Nirina as well. Uh, but from the chat box, we have first question from Malika is, uh, how large is the number of students who usually opt for this year? Um, so the when we started the foundation year two years ago, the plan was to try to attract 40 students in the first year. And we had almost 300 students last year. And this year we have, I think, 370 students enrolled. Okay, great. Uh, great. Next question. Um, Carl sent this message about 15 minutes ago, so it's probably talking about a specific area of your talk. Yeah. Where he says, is this not very similar to the concentration and ownership of media corporations where six corporate bodies own all media establishments? In 2010, they were holding $36 billion more than the GDP of Finland in 2010. Uh, it's incredibly hard for minority and less privileged demographics to be fairly and honestly represented. I completely agree. And you've hit the nail on the head. What you've just done there is an analysis of the power relations in global media. And you've probably found that they're very concentrated among certain groups in the world, while others have very little access to any power. Yeah. Good question, by the way. Or well, great stats, too. Okay. Uh, the next question we have is from Jay. Um, hello, I'm hoping to study a degree, politics and international relations at SOAS, but I want to do the foundation year first so that I can get a better understanding of how to study properly for the degree. My question is that after the foundation year, will I need to apply for the degree or do I transfer into the degree? No, once you're accepted on the foundation year, you are on your degree. So as with any other year in, in university, you just need to pass your modules on the foundation year and then you'll automatically go on to politics and international relations. I believe that also answers Freya's question, how does the application to a degree course at the end of the year work? So yeah. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to take that as done. Maybe uh, I should just, because even some students who have enrolled on the foundation year and are a couple of months into the foundation year still ask questions about this. Once you are on the foundation year, you only need to pass the foundation year to get on to first year of your degree. And that's any degree in SOAS, whether it's politics, law, international relations, Korean anthropology, etc. But another thing to remember is that the foundation year is not a standalone. Um, you don't get a certificate at the end of the foundation year. So it's not like a standalone qualification in any way. It's part of a degree. And um, while you're talking about that, Robin, there's another question about whether a student on the Business, Economics, Management and Law Foundation course could then go on to do a politics degree. Yeah, so you, you certainly could. Um, I'm not sure why you would do that, except perhaps you thought economics would be very helpful for you. But you absolutely could do that. And I think what we find is that as the year progresses and you develop more awareness of what SOAS is like and of what different subjects are about. Certainly when I came out of secondary school, I had no idea of what anthropology was or what international relations actually involved studying. But on the foundation year, you'll learn more about different academic subjects and maybe you'll develop your interests and change your mind. So I would be hoping students will change their mind as the year goes on. And as I said, whether you're on female or business management, economics and law stream, or the social sciences, arts and humanities stream, you can choose a degree from anywhere on SOAS. Okay, uh, we've got a question from Jay, and Jay asks, um, how is the foundation year assessed? How is the foundation year assessed? Okay, so you have on the foundation year, a core module, academic practice, which runs for the entire year. You have a core module or a module that continues throughout the year called, which is your introductory course to business management, economics and law or social sciences, arts and humanities. And then you have four other modules. So for each module, you might have different assessments. So on cultural fluency, for example, 
you have a presentation and a portfolio. Um, on World from SOAS, you have a portfolio and a long essay. For academic practice, at the end of the year, you do a kind of micro dissertation where you write a research based essay um, on a topic of your choosing. But in general, the majority of the assessments will be essays because we're trying to train you to write fantastic academic essays because when you go on to your degree, that will be the most commonly way that you're assessed. But assessment overall, over the entire year, you can expect to produce portfolios, presentations, different types of reports and essays. And just the technical part then of the assessments is that you need to pass your modules on the foundation year, but I, or you need to get a certain amount of credits. So you need to pass your modules, but if you were to not pass a module the first time, you can resist in the summer. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, a similar question, I guess, is, is this course taught through lectures mostly? Is this course taught through lectures mostly? Through, I think in your 10 hours or your 10 contact hours a week, you would have two hours of lectures. Yeah. So I would say you'll spend more time in seminars with, with the lecture, but with the emphasis being on you contributing um, your own ideas your own reading and discussing ideas and issues and arguments with your classmates. Great, thank you. Uh, an interesting question here is, uh, do you believe that Western culture will ever evolve from patriarchal domination due to the fact that globally other cultures have been westernized through patriarchal ideals, making it harder for minorities to be heard or even accepted? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the... the the short answer is that I can see things changing very slowly in the environment I live in the United Kingdom right now and also in Ireland where I grew up. And I also lived in, in Korea, Thailand, Argentina and Ecuador in my 20s. And I've seen changes in terms of not only equality in terms of gender, I think there's also a global growth in awareness about equality and issues of representation to a huge extent because of social media and access to information. But I mean, whether we will see a dramatic change in my lifetime, I don't know. I actually don't know how to answer that question. Yeah, but very good question. Maybe we should try would be uh, the best answer I could give maybe. Okay, great. Uh, next, uh, should I take AS or A-level exams uh, for the foundation year or any other exams such as proficiency in English? Well, that would depend on the background you're coming from. I'm taking it, you're, are you studying in another country? If you haven't got A levels or A AS levels. Um, I will see if I can unmute them. Uh, do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, uh, I don't have any AS level because I'm from Russia. We have only state exam. Um, okay. Actually, so we have a proficiency in English. Um, which is only Cambridge one. And I got an FC exam recently. I passed it. So, okay. I want, so uh, do I have to pass another uh, exam such as CP or YILTS or something like that? And should I take AS level and how to prepare for them during foundation year? Um, I don't think so. But I think what you should do is contact the foundation year address available on the website. I'm afraid I don't know the exact answer to that question. Um, I imagine that 
we'll need some measure of English proficiency and some evidence of having um, completed whatever education you've completed. But I can't see why you would need to take AS level or A level while you're on the foundation year. I'm sorry, I can't give a more absolute answer, um, but I'm sure we could help you if you could contact. Hey, thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Year. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question we've got is, um, how many students does one class usually consist of? Um, so, the classes, the average class size at the moment is 23 students per class. Um, so, but I would expect, you know, with the way class sizes work, well, you can expect class sizes, I would think, of about 16 to 20 students per seminar. Okay, thank you. And uh, so the next question is, what would be the pass mark for the foundation year? So the pass mark for the foundation year is the same as the pass mark throughout SOAS for every year of your degree, which is 40. Yeah. But remember that that's not a percentage in the way that the academic marking scheme works. That's not exactly 40%. Um, but yeah, 40 is the mark. Taking into account that 75 would be a very high mark. Okay. Uh, I've got a question from Anonymous, which is, could you go over the maths aspect of the foundation year, please? I can try. I don't teach on um, maths, thank God. So we have a module called um, Quantitative Reasoning and Numbers in Term 2, which introduces some practical aspects of using mathematics and data for academic purposes. Um, you don't need any experience of doing maths to take this module. It really is just there to help you learn how to use data and numbers for your academic studies. We also run additional mathematics support classes for those students planning to go on and study economics. Um, because for the micro component of economics, you need stronger math skills. So we have additional support for students who will need more sophisticated math skills on their degree. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, this question you might have already touched upon, uh, but uh, the question is, um, I affirmed for the Humanities Foundation year and remember reading about making a portfolio as an assignment through website development and marketing. How does that relate to the wider range of course content and modules? Okay, so there's also there's a module called Digital Skills and Technology, which aims to help you develop the type of technology skills you may need for academic study, but also for work life. So, I mean, Narina, Narina, I don't know if you actually can help me here because you've experienced um, the module itself. I've only seen the work that the students have produced and they work on producing things like um, uh, what was I going to say? They have produced work like a video CV, a digital portfolio, um, utilizing different type of technology skills. And then we use some of those skills on cultural fluency for producing the final portfolio. But in general, I think that that module is more focusing on the type of skills you'll need in work life than in academic life. Um, like I said, is it, is it Narina who's the student rep? Yes. Um, so so yeah. just, it's a summary yeah, of what you were doing on digital yes. skills and technology. Definitely. So with digital skills, it was very much um, like you were saying, creating a video CV, creating a hobby video. So it was a lot about developing your digital skills, as it were. So um, learning how to create tables from an Excel spreadsheet, learning how to use things like Adobe Spark to create videos, um, learning how to copyright correctly, which is very important. <laughs> you don't want to get in trouble for plagiarism. 
And um, also think learning things like coding, HTML coding, embedding that onto a website, creating your own website. So it is um, very much like Robin said, learning skills that you're going to need in your work life. But it's also very useful in the sense that, um, for example, learning how to create tables from an Excel spreadsheet of data, we're going to need that a lot in terms of writing reports. So writing reports, um, having these tables in them, referring back to them, sourcing your data correctly. So um, that is what I would say is a summary of the digital skills and technology module. Um, but I can definitely say it's a lot of fun and it's very, it's very different to the rest of the modules in terms of the things you learn as well as the way you're assessed. So yeah, that's what I'd say. Okay, great. Thanks, Narina. Okay, we've got time for one more question, uh, which is, are there mentors for new students who join at the foundation year? Absolutely. So every student is allocated an academic advisor. Um, that academic advisor is somebody who you can draw on for support during the foundation year with any academic issues you're having. That academic advisor will be able to hopefully help you with any non-academic issues that are affecting your studies, maybe not in terms of giving you personal support themselves, but directing you towards different um, departments we have, which can help you with those issues. And also the academic advisor then should be able to help you moving forward in terms of maybe the degree choice you want to make or the skills you feel you'll need to develop to handle your degree. Great. Well, uh, thank you very much for attending the session today. I just want to say thank you to both Narina and Robin for for giving the talk and of course thank you to all attendees here today and I hope you enjoyed the session and uh, please get in touch with us on the, uh, with the addresses available on the website if you want more information.